Thank you. It is truly an honor and privilege to stand in front of you and especially to sit with such an esteemed panel. So I have the honor of kicking us off and laying the groundwork for our amazing discussion. And I also am highlighting one article out of a phenomenal collection. And so again, I wanna encourage all of you to read that as we really try to dive in to one aspect of multiple facets that we need to consider around universal health coverage. So as it was pointed out, I wear some different hats. So I'm an emergency medicine physician on the front line seeing patients. I've worked internationally in multitude of different environments, uh, but I always look to see what is bringing that patient before me. And I am increasingly, and unfortunately, I believe increasingly in the future, I believe the climate crisis will be contributing to what is bringing patients to me. So I've thought deeply about how it's impacting clinical practice and our ability to deliver healthcare. So there has been increasing discussion and recognition of the connections between the climate crisis and health. But there is a linked but different discussion that we need to have around the connections to universal health coverage. And so when Ashish and I sat to write this paper and really try to quantify and outline what these intersections are, we asked ourselves three questions. So how does climate change threaten our ability to achieve effective universal health coverage? And who is the most vulnerable? Is there an overlap or synergy there? And most importantly, how can we move forward? Now this last question about how we can move forward, I'm gonna to touch on briefly, but honestly, I'm hoping that that's where our discussion can go as we really tap into the expertise of our panelists. So we're all achieving this, universal health coverage, and we sort of identify it on around three big issues. We need it to be accessible, we want it to be high quality, but we need it to be affordable. But as we're seeking to achieve this, we can no longer look in our rearview mirror for how to do that because the world in front of us is different. And I would argue that this is why. So climate change, as we all know, but just to put us on the same page, is as there's been rising levels and concentrations of greenhouse gases, it's called a multitude of effects. But three big ones are the rising temperatures and more heat waves, intensification of extreme weather, and higher sea levels. So we tried to quantify where this intersection is, and we came up with five key areas. And what I'm gonna do is walk through each of these five areas and discuss and just highlight how climate change is threatening these aspects, but then also discuss what the impact on achieving UHC will be. So changes in disease burden. We know that a multitude of reasons why individuals suffer health problems are from non-communicable diseases. And these are, as with so many other things, directly impacted by the climate crisis. So you think about, we know cardiovascular and pulmonary issues, lung problems, that those are negatively impacted not only by heat, but also another key thing we have to consider here is what's driving the largest increase in greenhouse gases is the burning of fossil fuels, and that causes air pollution, so particulate matter, which is also known to have a, a range of issues on non-communicable diseases, again, especially lungs and heart, for example. There's also was a recent paper that was published in the BMJ um, that showed that as rising temperatures is also associated with an increased incidence of diabetes. Now more work needs to be done around this, but I often describe our current understanding of the health burdens as an iceberg. I recognize the irony in that. But we see what's above the surface, but I think there's a host of associations that we have yet to discover. And I think that is one of those forward thinking examples. Infectious diseases, we know that it's worsening vector-borne illnesses. So we think about malaria and dengue. We think about occupational hazards. So workers uh, who are, whether it's indoor or outdoor, are shown to have increased risks at work with rising heat, for example. So what does this mean for UHC? So if there's these rising associations and rising burdens of disease, and it's changing, what does that mean for utilization and costs? In addition, as 
again, these disease patterns are changing, whether that's novel diseases that are now coming to new areas, or if it's a shift in the existing disease burdens, what does that mean for our coverage of essential services? The second big category is population displacement and migration. So there is an estimate that there will be 143 million displaced individuals in just three regions alone by 2050. And as you'll see, there are some examples here on what might be driving these displacements. But it's also happening in the US. And there's an example I often give that there was a patient who came to my emergency department directly from Boston Logan Airport with her airport, or with her luggage, and she was displaced after Hurricane Maria. And she came with a bag of medications, empty bottles in a Ziploc bag that still had part of a tree branch that was stuck in it. And she came not knowing where she was going. She had no connections to health services. And if that's happening here within the US, often people think it's you know, other places. We know that it's happening in much greater frequency in other regions. And so this is something we have to consider on what does that mean for us to achieve effective universal health coverage. So these displaced populations are gonna have unique needs, whether that be culturally sensitive needs, again, novel diseases that those healthcare providers in that new area are not used to seeing, and think about the mental health impacts that these individuals are facing. The evidence is pretty clear that conflict and especially extreme weather can cause post-traumatic stress syndrome and multitude of other mental health impacts. And these are all things that thus these new systems will need to think about. And of course, increased volume of patients in these new areas. The next one is rising poverty. So it has been estimated that 100 million more people are gonna be thrown into extreme poverty by 2030. And you'll see there's a variety of mechanisms listed here, but when you think about what poverty means for UHC, not only does that mean that these individuals already are gonna be more at risk for health issues, but you also recognize that they may need more financial assistance, right, from governments. And so as we think about these financial structures with which to fund this, it is something that has to be taken into account. The fourth one is one that I think is increasingly being recognized, but I think has historically been talked about less. And that's disruption of our healthcare infrastructure and our ability to deliver care. We can have the utmost technologies. We can be on the cutting edge of understanding how the climate crisis is impacting health in a certain region. But if you don't have a facility to be able to provide that care in times that your community needs that care, then where are we left with? What are we left with, I should say? So some examples here around, again, infrastructure. So you think facilities can be damaged by extreme weather events. Power outages. Now suddenly these power grids are being utilized by systems that are having increased energy requirements. In fact, in the US, our energy requirements actually went up in 2018. And that has been attributed, at least partially, to the fact that there has been an in increased number of heating and cooling days. So as we face increasing hot heat waves and more people are using air conditioning, which again is good for health, protecting people, but that means more energy usage. And so there's been you know, case reports and stories about power grids going out. And now you have hospitals that not only have power, you have patients who can no longer use their power dependent um, devices at home. And you think about that again on, if that can happen here, think about how that's happening in areas that maybe have a little bit less resiliency inherently built into their systems. Supply chain disruption is another one. And I think you know another good example is the saline shortage that happened after Hurricane Maria. And we highlighted this um, in the paper. And so there were already kind of intermittent shortages, but then after Hurricane Maria, there were dramatic shortages to the point that even in my hospital, practicing in Boston, we did not have IV fluids for patients. Just let that settle for a second. So patients would come in and they would be vomiting and having diarrhea, what we ter commonly term gastroenteritis. And they of course would expect to have an IV placed, right? I mean, that's just what happens. But if they didn't meet that criteria, we could not give them saline. And I would literally, we stocked Gatorade in a refrigerator in my emergency department, and I would hand them a Gatorade. 
And you can imagine the surprise, right, that individuals would express when I handed them that. And one guy rightly said, well, I could have done this at home. And I'm like, yes, you could have. Um, but at the same time, it was an opportunity for education, right, and to actually show these connections. And these supply chain disruptions did not just happen in the U.S., but happened in, in multitude of other areas. And again, all of that flows downhill. So think about transportation. Um, think about how workers are going to hospitals. Think about how patients are trying to get to care. And think about the public health and disease surveillance. I mean, oftentimes, right, we're struggling, and especially in certain regions of the world, to appro have appropriate surveillance now, let alone when there's disruptions in the existing infrastructure. Are we going to be able to continue to do that at the critical times? So these are the projected impacts for UHC. So again, you could prevent just high quality essential services. Uh, individuals may be unable to actually get to care, and even if they can get to where care used to exist, is a facility actually gonna be able to still be providing care? And then all of that is gonna trickle down to cost, and what is that additional cost on health systems? The last one is around the disruption to healthcare workforce and impairment of workers themselves. So there's evidence that has shown that our ability to think when it's enormously hot is impaired. And so that means not only for patients, but think about what are the implications for healthcare workers who are working in extreme heat around the globe or in areas that don't have air conditioning for whatever reason, perhaps because they lost power. And how, what if those workers can't actually get to their job? What if extreme weather has impeded their ability to travel? Now, even if patients come, are there enough workers to actually provide the care necessary? And the last piece is that these workers and all of our colleagues, we need to have a dynamic training and education that actually allows them to stay abreast with what the latest novel diseases are in their area and how those disease burdens are changing. So the, what are the impacts for UHC here? So again, there can be provider shortages by this geographic redistribution. Workers are also going to be displaced and or migrate along with other portions of the population. And so how do we think about building that in to our systems? And is there concern for a lower quality of care? Are patients gonna be misdiagnosed because now there's a novel disease in the region that previously healthcare workers had not had as part of their training? And are we gonna be able to actually de detect when some of these novel diseases are actually coming into regions if our surveillance is not of the appropriate nature? So on to the second question. And that's who is the most vulnerable? So I'm gonna spend a little time looking at this map. So the, the map on your left shows a country's climate vulnerability. And you'll see that the colors are very low for the purplish color and very high for yellow. Now you'll see that the countries that have a very high vulnerability to climate is locates to certain regions of the world. But now let's move over to the right-hand map. And that's looking at, it's called the service index for universal health coverage. And so you can see the countries that have very um, robust UHC coverage are in purple, but you'll see the ones that have very low coverage in yellow. Now there's one thing you can, it's not perfectly aligned, but you'll see that there are a lot of similarities in these two maps. And so the areas that have the most vulnerability to climate change are also those that are already struggling to be able to provide appropriate UHC coverage. And that's important as we think about solutions and how we need a synergized agenda. So that leads me to question number three, the one that we are gonna hopefully be digging into in much more detail in the forthcoming discussion with our experts. But how can we best move forward? So we pose some of these in the paper around we need an approved understanding and an integrated agenda. I argue that we have to add a climate lens to everything we do moving forward. So an example, do we, can we develop a joint tracking of both sustainable development goals together? We need novel financial frameworks. There was actually a paper that had previously been published that we cited about using fossil fuel subsidies to fund UHC. Interesting concept. But we also need to mitigate the root cause of all of this. And 
Healthcare systems need to be leading on this mitigation. So how can they not only reduce their carbon footprint, but also make their energy systems more resilient? They no longer have to rely on a power grid if you have solar panels and other renewable energy sources, as an example. But we also have to adapt to climate change. We have to figure out how we can best protect individuals, especially the most vulnerable. Because as much as I would love to be able to snap my fingers right now and cure climate change, we could all go home. Uh, well, just focus on UHC, right, if we fix climate change. But then we're still left with greenhouse gases that have enormous lifespans. So we're already set on a trajectory. So we have to learn in an evidence-based way how to protect the most vulnerable individuals. And we need to have a local lens with which we do that because every area is different with different vulnerabilities. And last but not least, we have to develop resilience in our healthcare system so they can remain standing, which means we need to do assessments to understand where that vulnerability is so that we can then take our scarce resources and put them where it will best keep our hospitals standing when individuals need them most. So back to our three questions. So I hope that I have proved that there is a connection between climate change and universal health coverage, and that without thinking about climate change and how it threatens our ability to achieve UHC, we cannot achieve either. And who's most vulner vulnerable? I hope I've shown that the map highlights that the individuals who are most vulnerable to climate change, but also currently have the most difficulty in achieving high UHC are the same regions. And last but not least, any plan around universal health coverage has to take climate change into account. We have to recognize that our future is different than what we have experienced, and if we don't, then we're gonna fail at both of these goals. So with that, I have lots of thank yous to give because it does truly take a village, and I have the honor to work with an amazing team. But first off, I wanna thank the BMJ for their collaboration, and thank you for this, allowing this article to come forth. And most importantly, I have to thank my mentors, Ashish, um, and the other uh, individuals here, Katie and Robert, who helped on the paper, our amazing team in the back, Stephanie and Megan and Olivia, um, for planning this amazing event, and everyone else that's on here. So again, this paper and is a representation of a village, and I want to thank the village. So with that, um, I look forward to going to the panel. Thank you so much for the time.